Welcome. How's everybody doing tonight? Southern California is full of untold stories, but even more that go unheard. Authentic first-person experiences of life in Southern California. Real people amplified. Each show is unique because of who's involved and where we are. Some of our folks are experienced storytellers. Many are not. And for some, this is their first time on stage or speaking in public. And tonight's show is reflective of the range of voices, experiences, and perspectives of those involved. Together, we explore our region one story at a time. A special thank you to the California Wellness Foundation for their generous support of this project. No show would be complete without a host. Please join me in welcoming your unheard LA host, Bruce Lemon. Welcome to Unheard LA, A Deeper Listen. I'm your host, Bruce Lemon. This is the sixth edition of a special virtual event series where we reconnect with Unheard LA alums, taking full advantage of this moment in time where it feels like many of us are at least trying to listen differently and deeper. In the face of new restrictions to how freely we move through the world and a totally justified fear of what's next, many are more isolated than ever. Many who were already isolated as we continue to struggle with race, gender, and other social constructs that have come to define how we treat each other. Now, even with countless platforms to see and hear each other, there is no replacing the feeling of gathering live and in person. At this moment, our team and our storytellers are all coming together online from around greater Los Angeles. From San Dimas, Watts, Pasadena, Irvine, Echo Park, West Athens, Altadena, South Pasadena, Historic Filipino Town, and more. We are where you are. And we're in this together to have necessary and at times difficult conversations engaging with each other to understand how identity has shaped lives and experiences in Southern California. A deeper listen. First steps on the path to understanding, compassion, and change. Each story will be followed by a conversation with four amazing people. First up, I'd like to introduce you to Dana Amahir. She's the award-winning designer, developer, and data editor for KPCC and LAist, and co-editor for Race in LA and Racism 101. What's up, Dana? Hey, how you doing? Good, good. So the next hour, we'll share the stories of three Unheard LA storytellers, but I'm excited to introduce them to you now. Ash Nichols, Pickle, and Daniel Mazakane. How are y'all doing? I'm doing okay. <laughs> good to have y'all here. So uh, Dana, why don't you tell us a little bit about Race in LA and Racism 101? So Race in LA is an essay series that asks Angelinos to reflect on how race and identity shape their everyday lives. Race in LA now has several sub-projects in its ecosystem, including Racism 101. And Racism 101 was created as an opportunity for us to help our audience talk about tough race-related issues with each other through our conversation starter kit. The project includes a section we call For Us, By Us, that is a filterable database of podcasts, books, websites, written by one affinity group for another. It's intended for people who identify as black or multiracial or trans or non-binary to see themselves reflected in narratives as normal characters with strong voices and stories of their own to tell. Fantastic, so make sure y'all check that out. Let's jump into our first story, folks. Uh, I've heard about how relaxed airport security was before 2001. I wasn't really flying much before then. And, and who knows what it looked like after 2020. I understand the efforts to safeguard us from perceived threats outside. However, fear is a two-way street. The identity of a threat, an American, or a human is not universal. And TSA policies continue to be the source of conversations, points of contention, and sometimes punchlines for jokes. While being charged with ensuring our well-being, not all experiences for travelers are easy or equal. Here to share their experience, Ash Nichols. Did you know that airport scanners have a pink button for when they think you look like a girl and a blue button for when they think you look like a boy? And if your body doesn't match the button they choose for you, then you alarm the scanner. I never used to think of myself as transgender. I saw that as someone else's identity, someone else's story. I've always known I wasn't cisgendered, but I wasn't really a part of any communities. That changed one Tuesday morning at LAX. I didn't match either the blue or the pink button, and suddenly 
my body was a security threat. They insisted on referring to my groin anomaly. I explained, that's my penis, not an anomaly. I identified myself as transgender, thinking it would flag them to recall that training I hoped they had once. The word transgender just seemed clearer. Besides, I didn't fancy trying to explain my non-binary gender identity to a bunch of government officials at 7 a.m. I just wanted to be as accommodating as possible. Unfortunately, my willingness to openly discuss my genitals didn't assuage their suspicions. So my penis underwent its first pat down of the day but my groin was still regarded as a threat and an anomaly. So I was handed off to a supervisor for a full body pat down, which included my groin again and was very thorough. This new agent was sympathetic though. They expressed themselves as an ally of the LGBT community. They gave me agency in how my body was handled during the pat down. I felt respected. They did a full body pat down and then cleared and released me. Until their supervisor came and intervened. The new supervisor informed me that policy dictated that I be taken to a private room. It was required that they use the front of their hands on my penis to confirm that it was actually a penis. I had been understanding up to this point. I reasoned they had a job to do, and I could make it easier by being well behaved. But I couldn't imagine what would be required of me in that room. Tears started streaming down my face. All the coherent arguments I tried to make with the new supervisor were met with nothing but dismissive declarations. Every response was dripping with the word, ma'am, even though I was asking for the blue button. Ma'am, even though I wear men's clothing. Ma'am, even though my penis is all we can talk about. My penis, which they are still referring to as an anomaly. I argued I should have the right to consent to the button that scans me. Their mistake shouldn't give them the right to grab my genitals a third time but my rights didn't come into this equation. I alarmed the scanner twice. I was not allowed to go through again. That would be against policy. I flew several times a year out of this airport, this very security line, and never before had my penis been flagged as a potential threat or anomaly. That's when the supervisor treated me to a little lecture. The scanner operator chooses the pink or the blue button based on how you present. The word present was used against me like a weapon. I wasn't masculine enough to have earned the blue button. As if I was the cause of my own suffering. Besides, I was told I had failed under both buttons. As if I wasn't even recognizably human. The interaction was so bad that at one point, a fellow passenger felt prompted to intervene. They yelled at the TSA. She, he, I am really sorry, I don't know, but, but this is a human being. Why can't you just consider that and give them a little compassion? I felt so much love in that moment someone who had no idea who I was, no clue about trans issues, but they recognized pain and fear in my face, and they stepped up to protect me. But that's the moment I knew I was screwed. It only highlighted what I'd been fighting. The TSA had all the power here. Everything was subject to their whim, the whim of their policy, the whim of their binary, the whim of this supervisor. They could keep me from getting to my plane, from getting to my best friend's wedding. The supervisor left to 
check the policy again, ma'am, if that'll make you feel better. They took the sympathetic agent with them. My tears had stopped as I stood there looking at my credit cards and shoes sitting just out of reach in the busy airport. I looked at this awkward agent who'd been left to guard me. This agent who had been so alarmed by my penis that they went over their supervisor's head to prevent me from getting to my plane. The sympathetic agent, the only one making any attempt at treating me like a human, didn't wield the power here. And then there was me, who woke up that morning not expecting that one government official could so violate my sense of self in less than 15 minutes, who didn't know that months later I would feel anxious just walking down the street, wondering if my penis was normal enough today. Before this, I worried I wasn't trans enough. Now, I wondered if my anxiety would spike every time I traveled. I thought about how many people's bodies are considered anomalies. The suspicion they are subject to every day just for going to the bathroom or for asking to be visible with pronouns that refer to who they actually are. How trying to be non-threatening and fly under the radar is sometimes the only way to stay safe or sane. This wasn't the first time I was made to feel invisible. It was just the first time I admitted it. Even through my haze, I reverted to the coping mechanism I knew best. I tried to teach. I gathered up any patients I could find, and I took it upon myself to try and help this awkward agent understand. Maybe if I could, it would be better for the next person. It was the only agency I had left. The supervisor returned, shepherding the sympathetic agent who looked like an elementary school student being made to make a rehearsed apology they didn't believe in. The sympathetic agent explained that they were newly promoted, that they hadn't yet learned all of the policy details, that they were very sorry for the inconvenience that I'd had, but now they had to take me into a private area and do another pat down, this time with the front of their hands. They apologized again. The authoritarian supervisor looked smug. No policy had been checked in their time away. The sympathetic agent was likely yelled at. Maybe their promotion threatened. But the 30 seconds I spent in the private area with the sympathetic agent were infinitely easier than the 15 minutes I spent defending my existence to that supervisor. The pat down was explained in detail to me, but then the sympathetic agent barely touched me, before declaring that I was clear and free to go. Now. I could see the awkward agent watching in the corner, and I knew the sympathetic agent was going to get in trouble again for standing up for me. But I packed my things quickly and left. Six months ago, I thought my gender identity was only mine, that it was private. But it isn't. I am transgender. And trying to fly under the radar only makes me invisible. And I'm done being invisible. That was Ash Nichols sharing their piece from our Unheard LA show at the Assistance League of Los Angeles Playhouse in Hollywood. The piece is titled TSA. Ash joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Pickle and Daniel Mazakane, as well as Race in LA co-editor Dana Amahir. Dana? Ash, in your piece, you described your body as a security threat to the TSA agents. Like a lot of spaces in the world, theirs functions as a binary, like this or that, the blue button or the pink button, um, the red pill or the blue pill for all those Matrix fans out there. Can you talk a little bit about um, why you think that threat 
their perception of you just going um, about your business as a transgender person was powerful to them, um, was so imminently dangerous to them? So I think if there was a message that I heard loud and clear that day, it was that, you know, since I didn't match their buttons, that I didn't qualify as a person. So I was reduced to being an alarm on a scanner or a threat that had to be dealt with. Um, I think what made that threat kind of more imminent is actually a really personal feeling. Um, because I, I think that my existence as a non-binary person can feel to some people uh, like a direct challenge to their own identity. So, you know, it's like if I can exist outside of this gender binary, this gender binary that so many things are built on top of, you know, we have laws and customs and traditions and whole institutions that are built on top of this thing. And if I can exist just outside of it, then what does that mean? What does that mean for all of those things? What does it mean for that gender binary? And most importantly, what does it mean about them? What does it say about them, about who they are, about what their gender is? You know, it's like my experience as a trans and a non-binary person, I often feel like I'm a mirror because when people have really strong reactions to my gender of expression, um, it's almost always, almost every single time, it's, you know, they're not saying anything about me. A lot of times what they're doing is they're telling me about their own insecurities, their, their insecurity about their gender, their body, uh, the way they move through the world and who they are. Um, and I have many stories of people revealing very interesting things to me about that. It, it's really interesting as you were talking in your piece, um, you mentioned this person that the stranger in the airport uh, in the also in the security line that stood up for you. Total stranger, didn't even um, know your gender pronouns. They're like, I, I don't know you, but this is a person. This is a person. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how that relates to power dynamics a little bit. And I want to bring um, Daniel and Pickle into the conversation a bit. For the three of you, do you find that having people around you, whether they're strangers or friends or family, I feel like having these allies, whether you know them or you don't know them, kind of tips that balance of power. It's almost like it helps to not necessarily take the power back for you, but sort of take it back from the system that's trying to grab it from you. In your case, Ash, um, trying to grab it back from the TSA agents um, and, and pull it back toward, you know, where I think it rightfully should be, owning your own existence. Can the three of you maybe talk a little bit about some of the times that's happened for you? I think one of the times, for me at least, that, that stands out the most, and like I've written about it before, is I had a professor when I was back in like community college, this is years ago, and I was very early in my transition. And I had asked him kind of privately, um, hey, you know, I'm coming into your class, this is the name that I show up on on your register, but like, I want to go by this name. I use these pronouns. And like, I was at that point, I was getting clocked as male pretty consistently. And he had replied and seemed fine and was very polite about it and was sure. Until I showed up the first day in class. And he pulled me aside after class, and there's about 10 kids still in, in the classroom. And he goes, So what's going on? And he gets aggressive with me. And it basically came down to he accused me of attempting to take the class for someone else. Like, that was his justification for not wanting to respect my identity or my gender. And he demanded that I show him, like, two forms of ID. Like, he wanted to see my student ID and he wanted to see my photo ID so he could, like, know what I was and who I was. Like, this continued. It persisted for, like, two weeks where he demanded it because he was like, I'll go to the... He basically said he was going to go to his supervisor, and he was the head of the department. So, like, there was nothing I could do. It turned out that this guy was a family friend. Like, he grew up with my dad and my dad's brothers. Um, and it's so, like my family knew him. <laughs> and my family came in clutch. Like, they were immediately on my side. They were ready to throw down, basically. Like, I was in that position, and I was just ready to make it go away. I was like, you know what? I'll show them my ID, and it'll be done, and I can move on. And 
my family, on the other hand, were like, no, like, we're contacting the school. We're, like, this isn't going away. Like, we're not doing this. Because no one at the school really wanted to listen to me. I had contacted a couple of, of supervisors and things like that saying, hey, this is what's happening to me, but I don't know what to do. And their answer was like, well, there's nothing we can really do about it. Like, he probably shouldn't be asking that, but also, like, there's nothing we can do. And it took my family stepping in and them making a lot of noise and making a mess and contacting multiple higher-up people for it to go away and for him to, like, pull me aside after class again, this time privately, and be like, hey, so this wasn't about your situation. Like, he kept saying, this isn't about your situation. I was just concerned. And there are multiple people who told me I had a right to be concerned. And he was like, it, he made it into, like, oh, it's it's just to make sure that people aren't trying to get like, free passes in the class. Like, it's just to make sure that, like, no one's taking this class for another person. And I was just, like, in the back of my head, I'm like, who's taking an astronomy class for another person? <laughs> like, who's doing this, right? Like, it's not about my situation. Like, of course it is. Like, it absolutely is. It's, it's about what you think I am. And, or what you think I'm trying to be, right? But yeah, like, it, it came down to other cis people, in this case my family, making a stink because like one trans person against an entire power system built on cisgender suspicion of anyone outside of the binary and like there was nothing i could do that sounds like a horrible experience to have to have lived through especially from someone that knew you and knew your family and your family had to take that person to task to <laughs> make make sure that you know you were treated fairly it's great to have you know, allies and, you know, kind of an army in your, in your corner. But, you know, when, when you don't, it's, it's terrible. Pickle, have you had any sorts of experiences where you have or have not had someone to stick up for you? Absolutely. And I'm really grateful that Dan and Ash are sharing their stories because we all experience these microaggressions all the time. And I'll just forget about it. I'll just kind of like, you know, bury it. And then hearing someone's and I'm, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, well, that's never happened to me. And then I'm like, oh, wait, it happens every day. <laughs> oh, that's why it's just so, I think that we can, there's a danger of normalizing it. But yeah, I mean, I've had the macro aggression of like reading story. I do drag queen story hour. Uh, I've had the macro aggression of the protester with the sign literally like possibly armed getting in my face while I'm trying to like read hop on pop. Uh, which is really bizarre. And the parents are such staunch defenders that it's like, you know, I get kind of an extreme version of that where it's like I'm being defended. So that's a little scary, but it's like the microaggressions are in some ways even scarier because these are people that are supposedly on your side, making it clear on some some subcon subconscious <laughs> words do what you want them to do uh on some level trying to make it clear that even though they're an ally it's like they're an ally conditionally so you know i just the other day i work at a testing site and i had this experience where the the lafd sort of supervisor person I wore some fabulous coat that was like you know one of my drag pieces actually and i wasn't in drag she had made some comments earlier in the week about me wearing a crop top and that not being professional or appropriate. <laughs> she specifically said it wasn't the look they were going for, um, but then kind of backpedaled and was like, uh, because of exposure to the virus. And I was like, oh, but um, we're wearing short sleeves, so I don't understand the logic of that, but that's fine. And she said, oh, she's she's spent the rest of the week trying to, like, make it very clear that she's not homophobic by being very friendly to me, <laughs> thereby piling on more microaggressions. <laughs> uh, she was like, oh, that's such a great coat. You know, it takes a real man to wear that coat. Another supervisor who was nearby, um, who was kind of being lassoed into the interaction, was like, Oh yeah, it's a great coat. I would wear that coat. And you know, there was something about that that was really touching to me because it was, you know, he wasn't turning it into a gender issue. It was more just like, it's a piece of clothing and it functions and it's fabulous, whatever. And for me, it's not necessarily about the power they're lending me as much as it is negating the gaslighting. Because if another person in the room 
acknowledges that what's happening is insane, it it makes it it makes me feel less crazy because I think that our society is so staunchly defensive of policies that don't make sense. Yes, and to have yes. another person in the room say, this doesn't make sense, and your experience of feeling that way is valid. Thank you so much for sharing that, Pickle. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes it just takes somebody who's sane in the room to just undercut all the crazy in the room and return things to, you know, a status quo of normal. That it's not about this or that. It's just sometimes it's just a, a dope coat. With that, I'm going to kick it back to Bruce. All right. Uh, story number two, folks. I've been playing a lot of video games during this pandemic, and now, with increased representation, it's getting a little easier to pick my character. Until now, I, I just couldn't tell who represented me. Some had better luck and saw themselves clearly from the very beginning. Here is Pickle. When I was a child, I had a fascination with gowns and jewels. One time when I was six, my mother gave me my dead grandmother's diamond engagement ring to play with by the public pool. Needless to say, it no longer belongs to us. <laughs> and to be fair, mom and grandma had a complicated relationship. I also really liked video games. I wasn't particularly good at them, but I made the effort because that's what my friends liked and I enjoyed them. That's what video games are about, right? My favorite game? Super Smash Brothers. Basically, you pick a character from a classic Nintendo game and fight each other to the death in different battlefields. My character of choice, Princess Peach. She had this pink frilly gown with an emerald brooch on it, a cheap looking crown, and yellow hair. And she did all her fighting in pumps. <laughs> when she stood still, the breeze would catch the bottom of her dress, and she looked so dignified so royal. Her attacks were hitting the other players with a frying pan or hurtling her derriere at someone who would then explode <laughs> on contact. And she had this voice. She would say things like, so eat or ho cha, and I ate it up. Also, the best way to play as Princess Peach was to float around the edges of the playing field because she could like hover magically, and since I wasn't that good at video games, the other boys underestimated me and would forget that I was even there until they had beaten each other down and had no health points. Then I came in with my pink frock and frying pan and beat them into submission. <laughs> A tactic I'm happy to say I still employ in my adult life. <laughs> I loved her. More specifically, I wanted to become her. So I would play in the backyard, echoing the syrupy timbre of her squeals, queen of the toadstools, whatever that means. When I was 10 years old, I convinced my parents to get me a gown from Goodwill and these shiny white wedding gloves from a store at the Beverly Center, just like the ones she had. And I shoved my hammy fingers into those gloves and desperately squeezed my stout frame into that pink muslin or taffeta. It wasn't even pink. It was like mauve. <laughs> I do love a good dusty mauve. <laughs> Whenever I was feeling dramatic, I would disappear from the living room and reemerge without a word in my Princess Peach fantasy. I'd perch on an ottoman with all the grace and dignity that a chubby, uncoordinated preteen could possibly muster. Then one day, the dress disappeared from my closet. My parents were concerned. It wasn't quite normal for a young boy to do that, they thought. I started to see a child therapist, and my woven pink dreams sort of tumbled to the ground, now a pile of forgotten cheap thread. The dress was gone, and my friends weren't really buying into the Barbie fight club I was trying to start. <laughs> where we would buy Barbie dolls and make them fight to the death with the most dangerous weapon of all, glamour. <laughs> I still dreamed of wearing gowns and luscious hair and jewels and saying things like, go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. It's, it's Catherine Hepburn, okay. <laughs> My dreams were red acrylics and a side eye. Now, years later, I read to children often for Drag Queen Story Hour. 
Thank you. <laughs> and when I can, I wear a pink dress. I know my parents were doing the best that they could with what they had and what they knew. They wanted to protect me, just like I want to protect the children I meet. I want to protect them from the idea of permanence. I want to show them that our imagination is limited only by the weight of our own fear. I thought, maybe if I had seen someone like Pickle, maybe it wouldn't have taken as long to fight my fear of dress up to become who I am today. At a story hour recently, a boy who we'll call Rebecca wore a beautiful red dress. He was shy, but asked to take a photo with me anyway. After, his mother confided in me that he was wearing a dress in public for the first time. I didn't feel anything extraordinary in the moment. It's hard when you're performing and smiling and taking photos to process emotions. <laughs> Ask Beyonce. <laughs> I smiled and thanked her and sent them on their way. But I think of Rebecca often, and I'm deeply proud of them. It was perhaps the most tangible piece of evidence that this thing I was participating in had a lasting and meaningful impact on the people it touched. I wanted to share this because not a lot of dreams necessarily come true, and I don't think they should. We don't usually know what's best for us and what will really make us happy in the long run. That's just up to how the universe goes. But a lot of little dreams do come true. And for me, this little dream of one day being able to be a version of Princess Peach did. And I'm grateful for that. Even if I can't make you explode with my butt <laughs> or hide frying pans in my pocket, I can assure you I'm working on it. That was Pickle sharing her piece from our Unheard LA show at the El Portal Theater in North Hollywood. The piece is titled Princess Peach. Pickle joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Ash Nichols and Daniel Mazakane, as well as Race in LA co-editor Dana Amahir. Dana? All right. So Pickle, first of all, I want to join the Barbie Fight Club, or <laughs> is the first rule we can't talk about it? We can't talk about it, but I will pass you a note. Okay. All right. So anyway... In your piece, you said you thought that your parents did the best they could, um, but that you wish you could have known someone like yourself, your, your drag persona, when you were younger. What do you think are some of the ways that we as adults can nurture kids to explore their gender identity, to not be afraid of it if it doesn't match the community around us or around them, and to help them to learn to love who they are? Like, what would you have wanted? Um, what would you tell, you know, your parents now? Ooh, I think that the first step is these gender reveal parties have got to go. <laughs> it's got to stop. Uh, you know, there's some obvious, I just don't, you know, what I tell kids at Drag Queen Story Hour, or I kind of work it in sometimes, is that gender is not a multiple choice question, and that it's, in ongoing evolution and experience. And I think as we heard earlier in Ash's story as well, the binary doesn't work. And I'm not, I'm just not gonna tiptoe around being like, well, it works for some and doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> and if you think it works, you're delusional. And that's just, I, I just am not gonna apologize for that opinion. I think there are some things, you know, I think letting your child decide what they wanna play with is so essential and you know and one of the things i love about drag queen story hour is that oftentimes when i read in areas uh that are not saturated with drag like you know maybe communities that are not as are just haven't experienced drag um a lot of the times i'm the first drag queen possibly a uh, gender non-binary person that this child is meeting and the miracle of that is that they don't care <laughs> the ones who care are the parents because they've been they've been socialized to this other very binary way of thinking kids are I have never had a child say something transphobic to me like you know it's just never happened to me like I'm sure that it happens to other people but you know for me at these story hours the children are just like oh hi like you know they take everything at face value in a very beautiful way 
And I think that we need to give children the benefit of the doubt more and not assume that we know what's best for them in terms of their own identity. Like, for me, it was... I did play with Barbies, but, you know, my parents... And, and my parents, re- I really do believe they did the best they could. They're very accepting people. I want to preface that, that I do have a lot of privilege and that my parents... I mean, my father is gay and my parents are very queer, friendly. But, you know, even they were doing the best that they could, like, 15 years ago, tw- 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, and they did buy me Barbies, but... I would open those presents at home after the birthday party. Like, I didn't... And I remember distinctly at my 11th birthday party, I had asked for Barbies, for the Barbie Fight Club that we can't talk about. And I didn't get the Barbies at the birthday party. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer. I didn't get the presents. And then I got home and they were like, oh, we've got these presents, these Barbies. And I was like, why didn't... I don't understand. I didn't understand why that was happening. The impulse to protect is sometimes very harmful I think I think that you know if I had been sort of told like okay whatever like you know I think it's when people get so involved in your identity that the the dance there's like there's too many cooks in the kitchen I'm like there's barely enough room in my brain for me (laughs) I'm like you gotta go (laughs) Daniel Ash um if you could back up and maybe give advice to your parents as to, you know, how to help funnel you along is to, you know, explore your gender identity and to try and help you along that process and try and ferry you into, you know, accepting yourself and trying to figure things out. What would you tell them? Would you tell them to do something different or more of something? It's such a tough question because I think Pickle's totally right. Like all of the places my parents in particular stumbled was they were afraid. You know, they were afraid for me. They were afraid for themselves. Like, I distinctly remember a conversation with my dad where he admitted he was afraid of people thinking he had, like, made a mistake as a father. Like, that he was a bad parent. Like, I didn't come out until I was, like, in my 20s. And it surprised everybody because I was really good at hiding. I had a whole phase in high school where I was like, we are going to be, like, a straight woman and we're going to wear dresses. And, like, that is the rule, right? And part of that came down to like my parents without thinking about it like growing up said transphobic stuff and so I learned from a really young age the way they interacted with other random people in the world that like it wasn't okay for me to talk about this I guess like the thing that I always come back to is like you guys have to understand that your kids listen to the stuff you say like kids remember And they notice stuff and they understand from like a really young age, like the things you're saying about people who aren't them. Like I always, whenever I talk to people, like you have to like understand the awareness and extend agency to young kids. Like they know what's going on. Absolutely. Into the woods. Careful the tale you tell. That is the spell. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So I want to turn the conversation for a second to something that we talk about a lot with race. Um, And it's the idea of, like, exceptionalism. So a lot of times when we talk about, like, an other community, like our marginalized community, like different skin color or accent or sexual orientation or understanding of gender identity, we're underestimated as part of that group. We're not only seen as less than, but less capable. When we succeed, um, like Pickle owning the boys uh, when she was playing video games against them, it's exceptional. It's like, how much do we make gender fluidity and understandings of identity that aren't as much of society's like default, more normative? It feels like there's greater visibility than there has been in the past for things that aren't just, you know, fit in the box, like male, female. But how do we work toward like wider social acceptance, like making, you know, transgender and non-binary, and things that aren't just cisgender, like, more, more, it's just normative, more normal, like, more than just, like, oh, it's over there, it's marginalized. I think non-binary people need to be put in positions of power and given money. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a good call, good call. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. I feel it's similar with race, where it's, like, I really firmly believe that 
like, you know, transphobia, racism, homophobia are not complicated. Money is complicated. And, you know, people trying to protect their money is complicated. So they invent this narrative of like, well, you know, we have a complicated relationship with gender and race. And it's like, no, you don't want to give up your money. Anna Wintour doesn't want to step down as editor-in-chief of Vogue, so she, you know, slaps Naomi Campbell on the cover, and she's like, it's complicated. <laughs> you got to throw power in that in that mix, too. Yeah, money, yeah, power. power. Money and power, Absolutely. Yeah. And that power is, uh, and that, and that power is within your, your race or gender identity, uh, and that's how you've assumed that power. It's, it's hard to relinquish that. And then, like, the whole it's complicated thing is just a matter of, like, oh, that's what we've been doing for this entire period of time. So, so we can't do anything else. And it goes from, like, the macro level to the micro level, even with, even with like, family relationships. Like, the, the gender binary is programming. It's hard programming. Like, I, I remember my father trying to make sure I fit in that box of what a man is. You know, like you couldn't even be emotional, let alone anything else. Like he got me crying. He kicked the out of me. But like, that's what, that was part of, that's part of that programming. And that programming takes so much pain, so much rigidity. Uh, it's, it's, it's damaging. It's just all damaging. And then it, it carries on through your life. Like I can, I, I can remember the moments where I failed as a, as, as a, as a straight cis man to, to be a, an ally and to actually speak up and actually make a sneak and make a fuss when people are being ignorant and, and, and ridiculous. Like, and that comes from that fear that was beaten into me with that programming of that binary. Part of that comes back to like destroying the myth of like the good trans person. Like that idea of like the good trans person who's quiet and doesn't make noise and doesn't push back against people who are transphobic and doesn't talk about oppression. Right. And like, understands like it's just difficult and like people should come to it at their own pace and so like sit there and be quiet and be oppressed and let people figure it out on their own like that comes back to power struggle right like it's ridiculous and it happens in race and it happens in gender conversations and it comes back to that idea of of the binary and power and and who gets to have power Right. If I had a nickel for every time I had been told like, oh, thank you so much for being a good trans person. Like I, people like have told me that to my face. They're like, oh, thank you for being like the nice trans person who doesn't call me out. And, and, I, and I take them to task every time I have a slightly different style. I'm good with ridiculous people at times. I, I, I have a, a, a reflective style, I suppose. But like, um, but, you know, if I had a nickel for every time I've been told that and I have to come back at them and be like, it's not my job to take care of your feelings. I'm doing it right now because I can. I am a mirror as a person, right? So I like hold up a mirror to them and I ask them to think of a time that, you know, that they felt misunderstood or something, somebody made a horrible assumption about them or, you know, I ask them to like call that up in their body and they think about that and it centers it on themselves and how they feel. And then I'm like, okay, great. So someone has now said that to you 10 times today. And you, you know, that is not the first time it's been said to you. And I'm like, you're lucky they don't destroy you, honestly. <laughs> like, this is not the first time that they've heard that. And just because you think it's the first time you've said it, it's not, by the way. But just because you think it's the first time you said it to that person, doesn't mean it's the first time they've heard it. And they don't have to have patience for you or the horrible things that you say, or the terrible things that just exist that we've all been told and programmed to. But yeah, people have tried to literally pat me on the head and tell me like, oh, thank you so much for being that, that good trans person who's like taking care of my feelings. And I, I do do a certain amount of, as I said in the piece, I, you know, teaching is one of my fallback strategies, um, partly because it gives me agency and it's something I can do. Um, but it's also an approach that people are more apt to listen to at different times. Um, Although sometimes I really am jealous of the people who like do that really good confrontation, like just because I'm like, oh God, I wish I could just like yell and scream at somebody and say that, that really satisfying thing. But at the same time, my approach tends to be, I think, relatively um, successful at making a connection with someone and really getting them to reconsider what's going on. Um, but sometimes I wish to, I could just take them to task. <laughs> I just want to put one final thought out there before we move on to the next piece. Just touching on, Ash, um, something you mentioned um, in your last comment. We take these things on 
Um, and it's it's sort of, it's basically just learned behavior. It's not so much we're programmed this way, it's just, it's it's really learned behavior. I think that just as much as kids aren't born knowing what color they are. They're not, we're not born knowing race. It's kind of the same thing. We're not necessarily born knowing gender. These are things that are thrust upon us. It's like, you're not born knowing, hey, I'm a boy or I'm a girl or I'm whatever. I'm not, I'm not born knowing I'm black or white or or Latino or whatever. These are things that are learned and taught to us by society. And we're told that we're supposed to fit in a box. And as easily as we learn something, we can unlearn things too. And, you know, modify the way we think about them. Yeah, yeah. Well, learning, learning is programming. You know, just like you type in code into a, into a computer, we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're taking code. We're supercomputers. We're taking, that, we're taking code the whole time. And you got to reprogram your way of working, your way of thinking. You have the, your core programming. Like you always see it in, in the in the movies, like there's this core programming that the machine can't betray, you know, but like you change that core programming and all of a sudden it saves the entire colony, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're speaking my language as a developer. There you Some go. Some people are are ignoring the install updates that pop up in the corner. <laughs> yep. yep. They're like yes, absolutely. try again tomorrow. Try again tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Install later. Yeah. Install later. Yeah. Install later. Yeah. Or even in politics. Right. Let me try this again in ten years, you know. Oh my god. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to kick it back to Bruce. Let's keep this moving. All right, uh, and now for our third story of the day. What is the return on an investment in yourself? What degree of risk are you willing to take if the return is you? We're here to break it down for us. Our third storyteller, Daniel Mazakane. Check opened. September 5th, 1991, 2.08 a.m. 1. Double XL binder. Black. Yearly subscription. $45.98. Symptoms. Reduced lung capacity. Breakdown of breast tissue. The loss of feeling in breasts. Touch what is numb and know they promise a future where you do not carry this weight. One small packer, 3.75 inches, circumcised. $15.95. Symptoms. Chronic yeast infections. Constant reminder of your vagina. The first time you wear it, the hole in you feels temporary. Two pairs of packing underwear. $55.67. Symptoms. Your fake penis won't fit in regular boxers, but you still wear them with pride. Two vials of one milliliter depot testosterone. Self-inject twice monthly, $85.43. Symptoms, clitoral growth. Sacrifice your liver for a beard and record the ways you can see yourself in the mirror. Your reproductive organs will wither, but second puberty gives you a voice you recognize. Two 23-gauge syringes, $5. Symptoms, when you inject into a vein, don't call 911. It will hurt. You will feel that you are dying. Your heart and lungs will filter out the oil. Remind yourself you are lucky. Remind yourself that the pain is a part of your becoming. One double mastectomy, $4,876.05. Symptoms, six months spent unable to lift your arms. The numb promises of your body are kept, but nipple grafts cost extra. Look down and see the blank space you dreamed about. One gender reassignment, $6,085.80. Add metoidoplasty, $4,104. Add phalloplasty, $9,180. Add Incorporation of metaclitoris, $1,620. Add testicular implant, $1,620. Add penile implant, $7,776. Add scrotal construction from labia, $3,240. Add glansplasty, $1,080. Add vaginectomy, $2,700. Add urethroplasty, $1,080. Total, $36,865.80. Symptoms, pee standing up, 
using a urinal as a coming of age story, hope for minimal complications and find peace in the fabrication of your body. Subtotal, can you look in the mirror and see yourself yet? Only in thickened voice and beloved scars, total do, what truths did you find at the end of a knife? A puppet with cut strings, Neverland, flight, change do. Who was lost in the transition of power? A daughter looking for truth found himself, alive. Check closed, September 5th, 2017, 2.08 2 a.m. That was Daniel Mazakain sharing his piece from our Unheard LA show at the Garrison Theater in Claremont. The piece is titled USA Medical. Daniel joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Ash Nichols and Pickle, as well as Race in LA co-editor Dana Amahir. Dana? So Daniel, after I first watched your piece online, because I wasn't at the original performance, I scribbled down in my notes, damn, I have no words. And that is still very accurate. So one line just really sticks with me. Who was lost in the transition of power? Can you describe the internal and maybe even external power shifts that you felt in your transition process? It's so complicated, right? Like I talk about living on both sides of the binary and like kind of growing up female, right? Being raised female and and then transitioning later in life and like it was as simple as watching people start to listen to me on Facebook more. Like the instant you have a male name, say there's like someone, like some dude trying to like condescend to one of my female friends. And then you pop up and say the same thing, but you have a guy's name and a guy's profile picture. And suddenly they're willing to listen. Same thing in, in regular spaces. I remember in, like in classrooms there's like the middle ground where like i they don't really know how to read me so no one really listens and then the instant you're you're clocked as male you have professors who are willing to listen to you you have professors who are willing to like give you more weight in a classroom and they don't i don't think they they know i don't think they notice it right but when you go through that and you you're living it it's so much more noticeable so it's sort of like as they're able to figure out what box you fit into and like what power construct of society you fit into, you get treated differently. Yeah, absolutely. In general, like I don't think cis people notice just how much power in a social setting men get. Like if you're clocked as male, you automatically get more power, especially from other men. I mean, that's been true of like almost all of my interactions in academia and things like that. Like it's so much easier to track when you've been on the other side and you you recognize those struggles and then suddenly you're like, it's not happening to me. It's happening to the, the girl at the other desk. It's happening to that person. And then like you you step in, right? Like you have to step in. But yeah, it's it's wild. It's so it's so jarring. I still like I'm five years into my transition at this point, five or six years, something like that. Time doesn't matter. And I still walk into a room and I get clocked as male and it's jarring every time. Every single time I expect to walk into a room and get like someone misgendering me or someone figuring me out. And then like the power is gone. But like I walk into a room and I'm clocked as male and it's natural for me to be there and people accept me for who I am. Right. And that in itself is a type of power. I mean, earlier we talked about Ash's piece and how when you are visibly outside the binary, your power is completely removed because like you don't fit into a box. And, like, part of my power, part of, like, the power shift that I've had is being able to fit into a box. And it's a privilege. It's absolutely a privilege. So one other thing that I want to touch on is is another specific line from your piece, Daniel. Pain is part of your becoming. Um, You had a lot of really strong lines in your piece, and I was just drawn to so many of them. And this one, I'm sure that on many levels, this is something that all of us can really relate to in terms of a lot of things, but in terms of identity and expressing who you really feel you are, your true self, and just loving the person in the mirror that you see, what role do you see pain playing in that process? And I'm opening this up to to anybody. 
Um, I'm sure that everybody's got a different different answer. I know for me that, um, you know, I'm obsessed with kind of growing and evolution and change. And, and, and I think that being uncomfortable is a really necessary part of change. And sometimes being uncomfortable is pain. Um, that is that is a way that it, it happens. So I think that the painful things in my life have shaped me the most, for sure. But, you know, I think some of the things that have really been painful and scared me the most or threatened me the most, um, you know, are, I, my experience of it is to, I, I get knocked back a little bit, you know, at first, um, you know, like I described in the TSA piece about, you know, kind of panicking about my body and, and wondering if I'm normal enough. And like, you know, I think there was like six months of me feeling uncomfortable in the world and with my body. And then, you know, and there have been other times where I've been physically threatened for being visibly trans, visibly non-binary, visibly queer in the world. And I sort of like, I, there's a temporary mourning process of um, the safety that I had, or I thought I had, <laughs> at least. Um, and, you know, and it's scary. And, you know, and I get, and it's, it's hard, you know, it's, I get really down. And then I sort of figure out what's really important to me and I double down and I come back transer and queerer than the last time and, and come back at people. And for me, that's a, it's a really important part of like understanding like, you know what, this is important to me. This is an important part of who I am. It's very vital that I do this, that I show this, that I actively, I'm a, I'm a bit of a troublemaker in the world. So like, it's really important to me to, I think, I think rebellion and subversion are <laughs> super important um, and, and in that really necessary part of change in an ecosystem. And so I, I see myself as like, in, in my expression, you know, of how I choose to express myself, it's an act of defiance. It's very intentional. I, for me, the way I look is an intentional crafting to defy an expectation, to defy a category. There isn't actually very much an element of like my makeup presentation and, and the way I dress and everything that is a direct challenge to people. Try to categorize me now. Pick a button now. Ash, that is beautifully said. I love it. I love it. I love the rebel. I love the rebel. What do you think, Pickle? Any Anything to add here? Well, I love what's been said. What I was reflecting on, like, pain and, like, again, I was having an experience where I was like, that doesn't happen to me. And then I was like, oh, wait, yes, it does. <laughs> um, you know, in it's what's interesting to me sometimes about drag, one of the first things I told my mother that I was going to start doing drag, and one of the first things she said, to, she said was, um, she was like, that's great. I'm really happy for you. Please don't allow your drag to become oppressively sexist. And I am so glad she said that to me. Um, not because like I think I'm that those were my impulses necessarily, but it stays with me because there's so much sexism in the drag community and it's a huge problem. You know, I get I'm very tall and I'm kind of large. So like I struggle with this idea of like looking feminine or having this idea of like what my body needs to look like so that I look like, you know, a beautiful woman. And like, I have to challenge myself constantly in that way where I'm like, you know, my impulse isn't to wear corsets and hip pads all the time because they really constrict me. But then, you know, you get these, I don't want to call them microaggressions because they feel like macroaggressions <laughs> of like other drag queens being like, you know, you look like a box or like you're square, like your body doesn't look right or like your body's not da 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 da. And it's like, I have to remind myself that like my version of femininity and my version of, of what I'm creating is my own. And like, you know, I feel most feminine and most, you know, beautiful when I allow my body to look, uh, the way I enjoy it to look. <laughs> What a sentence. Um, uh, I say human words now. Um, and freedom of movement is so important to me. So, you know, there's a lot of, in entertainment, there's so much of that weird pressure to, like, physically bind your body and physically alter your body so that it looks the way, you know, they have decided beauty is. But the gag is that, you know beauty is determined by star power, you know, like Lizzo, for example, is just such 
an inspiration because she is so beautiful and it's her star power that makes her so physically beautiful as well and now you know someone like her is so important uh for me as well because I see her and I'm like she is so beautiful and maybe I'm beautiful just being who I am and and just because it doesn't line up with what society is saying is beautiful does not mean that it is not inherently beautiful well this conversation on you know thinking and being outside the box and nonconformity and rebellion and subversion has been amazing but i think we're coming to a close and i'm gonna kick it back to bruce thank you all for being with us here that's our show uh, thank you all the folks at kpcc and la's that make unheard la possible and to our extended unheard la family Special thank you to today's storytellers, Ash Nichols, Pickle, and Daniel Mazakang, and to Dana Amahir for racing LA and for being a part of this event and being a catalyst for important conversations like this. We are eternally grateful to the California Women's Foundation for their generous and ongoing support of Unheard LA from the very beginning. KPCC and LAS members, you truly make everything we do possible. Everyone has a story. What's yours? Share it with us at kpcc.org slash unheard LA. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our Unheard LA newsletter, the best way to be the first to find out about what's next. And once again, thank you for joining us. And remember, whatever you do, don't leave your story unheard. Bless you.